when working with men who were sexually abused as children. The primary difference in between working with women versus men is that with women, you first describe them as a survivor and then you move into recovery. With men, you first have to describe them as being a victim, then survivor, and then recovery. Being a man and admitting that you are a victim is tantamount to not being a man. There are nine basic reasons, according to Mick Hunter, that men are reluctant to seek treatment, or as he would put it, nine factors that negatively affect the recovery of the male survivor. One is a reluctance to seek treatment. Men are much less likely to go to therapy than women. If they don't see the pain on them, if they don't see the wound, then they refuse to admit it's just something in their head. I remember riding along with a policeman one time in Oakland on a night shift, and he said that he would never go into therapy because he would screw up his perfect organization inside. The guy was a total train wreck, but he was perfect. And he didn't want anybody messing with that. Two, a tendency to minimize the experience of victimization. If he was sexually abused by a woman, he was lucky. If there, he just, there's, it's all in his head, uh, boys can't be victims, and to admit that he was a victim means that he wasn't a man. He didn't take care of himself. And so consequently, he minimizes that. Little boys, from the moment that they're popped out, are told to be, they're little men, they're not little boys. He's told to take care of his mom. He's told to protect. And so he downloads this, he believes this, that becomes part of his conceptualization of what it means to be male. And so to admit that he's a victim is not to be a male. The third is the tendency, or I should say, the difficulty in accepting shame and guilt. Shame, feeling bad about who you are, guilt, feeling bad about something you've done, didn't do, wanted to do, thought about doing. But, and so those are again emotions. And a lot of men are really reluctant to deal with their emotions because one, they weren't taught how to as children. Two, they weren't valued as being important. And three is they're so constipated from all of the pain that's never been processed that uh, they're afraid if they lift the lid on any of that or take the scab off of it even a little bit, they're going to be overwhelmed, they'll die, and they'll never recover. Number four is a propensity towards exaggerated efforts to reassert masculine identity. The largest group of male survivors, sexual abuse survivors in the military, are in the Marines because they have to prove they're a man. They feel like their manhood was questioned or taken away in some form during the sexual abuse, and they're out there to prove that they're a man. And so they put themselves in these crazy places and situations in order to reassert their masculinity. It may be exaggerated bodybuilding. It may be uh, jumping out of the highest plane or doing these dangerous things. Uh, there's a certain degree of testosterone poisoning that happens in adolescence anyway. Kids who jump off of roofs or lay down in the middle of freeways just for the thrill and the joy of it. There's a certain percentage of boys that die in adolescence because of that behavior. But if they've been sexually abused, there's an exaggerated tendency to put themselves in these risky situations to prove that they're indeed a man. There's also just the difficulties with male intimacy is number five. They're trained that all intimacy is with women. So they had this sexual intimacy very likely with a male or they were overwhelmed by a female. And so they don't know how to get there. It's really hard. Again, that's cracking that open. It's getting vulnerable. It's getting exposed in some way that is not easy. And they're not really excited about opening that door. Behavior and patterns with power control dynamics. If they're in your office, they're submitting to your power in some form. Uh, one time I had a gentleman who uh, his girlfriend called me and said it was an emergency. His, her boyfriend needed to come see me immediately. They were having this big fight and he was a ma massive sexual abuse victim as a child. Big, tall, handsome guy. And he comes to my door and he's literally arguing with her on the phone. 
And so I open the door and he comes in. He goes up the stairwell to my office. There's a sign in my hallway that says, take your shoes off before entering the therapy room. He looks at the sign and yells out, my perpetrator made me take off my shoes too. And then he wanders into the therapy room. He sits on the edge of the couch. I sit down in front of him and he says, okay, fix me. He did not really want to relinquish any control or power here. And it was out of a great protest that he was even there in the first place. Number eight, a tendency to externalize feelings. And what that means is, is that uh, I may feel bad on the outside, but I'm going to focus on the amount of hair in my head, the size of my dick, how somebody else is treating me. Everything's on the outside. We do anything to avoid going on going to the inside and associating that pain with how we feel because that doesn't feel controllable. That doesn't feel like we can blame it on something. And again, the hair, the penis size, the relationship size, it's a way of being a victim. There's no fixing that in their mind. And so they just collapse. Number nine is a vulnerability to compulsive behavior, simply meaning alcohol, drugs, sex, all the different things that guys use to distract themselves from what's going on inside by staying involved in these other activities. So let me talk a moment about the clinical issues that uh, come up. The most common is dissociation. It means they've left their body, they're over there someplace, they're actually operating in a fog because if they were to be focused and aware of their feelings, the feelings would be too much. So it's much safer for me to be a little bit outside of myself. There's a scale we call the back of the head scale in which we have people ha put their hand where they are. Are they here? Are they back there someplace? Are they up front here someplace or over there to the side? We have them put their hand where they're really at at that moment. It's quite instructive. Depression. Guys, again, don't want to admit that they're depressed and they can go through their lives depressed and they look very different than women being depressed. They may get up, do their work, they'll drink, they'll do whatever, but they're never going to talk about how they feel. But their actions are communicating it quite loudly and so they'd have to be willing again to deal with that. Substance abuse, we're back to the compulsive behaviors and alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, OA, NA, uh, MA, all of the anonymous groups are full of men who were sexually abused as children in one form or another. Compulsive sexual acting out, using sex. If I stay in the eroticized part of this shame, then I don't have to deal with the pain underneath. And so I'm going to have one sexual partner after another. A recent movie uh, by Steve McQueen called Shame is probably the best description of, of somebody I've ever seen in terms of he was clearly sexually abused as a child. There's a strong insinuation of, of incest and more in the film. And so he uses pornography and prostitutes and all sorts of sexual acting out as a means of avoiding that pain inside. And then over the course of the film, something happens that the pain gets so loud that he can no longer distract himself from it and he just about disintegrates. It's a painful, beautiful, profound film that I highly recommend. Self-abuse uh, can be everything from cutting to the compulsive behaviors to putting himself at risk. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that guys can abuse themselves, putting themselves in dangerous situations. And then there's the acting out the rage. Uh, I once saw a documentary about men in prison who had killed gay men. And there was this one guy, probably in his 30s, he was unbelievably huge bodybuilder. And just a sight of a gay man would send him into rage because he was sexually abused as a child. And so every gay man in the world to him was a perpetrator. And he had no other way of seeing that, of seeing gay men, that they were all out to get him. And so he's acting out that rage. And some guys do it randomly. Some guys do it on their sexual partners. Some people focus on gay men as if all gay men are perpetrators. And so it's not logical, but that's what they're doing to take care of, protect themselves. Treatments. 
The gold standard on working with men who were sexually abused as children is EMDR. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. The website is emdria.org for emdrinternationalassociation.org. There's a directory there to find therapists throughout the country, and then there, I believe, there's links to even out of the country, out of the U.S. for uh, EMDR International. Uh, it's a fine organization. There's lots of really superbly trained therapists. But the theory is is that when we have trauma that it gets trapped on one side of the brain or we get stuck. And so we get into this loop that we can't get out of. And by using EMDR, which is simply alternating bilateral stimulation set up in a very specific way by a clinician, is that we get both sides of the brain working on this problem. And what we do is we're clearing out that blockage that's stuck. And we're then getting all the associated memories with that. And what we're doing is we're opening up those neural pathways so that we can resolve that. But we get out of that loop and suddenly something that was the biggest focus of our life or has the biggest negative charge on it simply doesn't bother us anymore. It's profound. It's a paradigm change in terms of psychotherapy. It's been around now for uh, over 20 years. And I highly recommend that when you seek out help for someone who is sexually abused as a child, is that you consider an EMDR therapist. It is a game changer. And there is absolutely no reason in the world to extend the pain of a man who is sexually abused if it is all possible to stop it. The caveat I give is that for a man to be successful with EMDR, he has to have some awareness of feelings in his body. If he's completely trapped in his head and completely cut off from his feelings, then the first step is going to be getting him attached to his feelings. Then you can do the EMDR. Group therapy has long been the gold standard for treating men who are sexually abused as children. It's fine, it has its place. It's not fast, it's a bit old school. I think it's a nice adjunct to doing some serious 101 EMDR, but in and of itself, I don't believe it's really a, a treatment for men who are sexually abused as children. It lets you know you're not alone. It puts it in a broader context, but ultimately you really need to get in there and do the individual therapy, preferably somebody who's doing some kind of, is doing EMDR uh, and really work through the trauma as quickly as possible. Couples therapy is actually an excellent place to do some work on this issue in that it's because you get to see the direct impact of the sexual abuse on your partner, on the relationship, and it requires both of you get to a deeper level of vulnerability and intimacy, which ultimately is going to strengthen the relationship as you have space and empathy and compassion and processing and dealing with this. Again, individual therapy is also required and necessary to do with that. I also am a big proponent of reading. The gold standard book for men who are sexually abused as children is Victims No Longer by Michael Liu. Also, any book by Mick Hunter, he wrote Sexually Abused Males, there's two or three different versions of that around, are really quite excellent. Michael Liu is much more in tune with the emotional piece. Mick Hunter is much more about the data, the information, being very straightforward. I'm also a really big believer in Gestalt therapy. Gestalt is really about being in the room with the therapist and both of you impacted and on this journey and the therapist owning the role that they're playing in this process. It's very real, it's very interactive, it's very dynamic, and it's still about the client, but it brings the healing to a different level. And it's a really important possibility or part of the healing here. And combined with the EMDR and the other resources can be really work amazingly fast. General psychotherapy, uh, not all psychotherapists are really capable of dealing with this. They either haven't done their own work or they have their own projections about what it means to be a man. I've had far too many men come into my office who have complained about therapists who've told them they were a crybaby or they were exaggerating the problem or told them to grow up and be a man and just did not empathize with them in any way. And that's just profoundly painful. And while I'm a big proponent of psychotherapy, obviously. It's finding the right therapist. And if you're going to do 
psychotherapy, finding somebody who has some experience in this, or at least is getting consultation from somebody who's really experienced in working with men. Working with women is different. It's a different set of issues. Yes, there's overlap, but men are not the same as women and they need to be treated accordingly. Again, I'll reiterate, it's ideal for treating with the MDR. There's no faster way to face the pain and move through it, so you don't have to live in that pain. I'm going to set the frame for the healing container at this moment. So first of all, there are two jobs that a child has the moment they pop out. One is to download the love of mom and dad. That's their attachment issue, and how well they download that love of each parent is going to be how they're in relationship with that gender. The second job of childhood is to make sense out of everything. From the moment they pop out, they're getting overwhelmed with all the stimulus and data. It's like, where did these lights come from? But they don't know their lights. I'm being touched. They've been in this warm, sealed environment for the past nine months, and all of a sudden they're popped out into the world and they're supposed to know what's going on. And so from that very first instance, their brain is collecting data and they're starting to reach conclusions. Ah, that person's making me feel good if there was enough sense of there, but they're, they're in their own terms, in their own way, making sense out of what is happening. And so over childhood, we problematically reach grand conclusions before we have enough data. In other words, the baby crying in the crib and left to cry out and not tended to by mom or dad may reach the conclusion that I'm not lovable, that my needs are not important, and that may be the foundation for how they are the rest of their life. And so this is really important in terms of sexual abuse is because in that sexual abuse, they're going to come to some conclusion about what that means about them and how they are in the world. They may think, I can't take care of myself. The world isn't fair. I will just give up. Someone stuck here is just going to be a victim. They have proof. And they live out this reality in many ways. And whatever our reality is, because we create our own reality, we will look for that verifying data to validate that reality and discard all the rest. Big part of the job of a psychotherapist is to point out the pieces they're ignoring and to break up that fantasy about how the world really looks. So now I'm going to describe for you two theoretical perspectives from Gestalt therapy. I'm a Gestalt EMDR transpersonal therapist, so you get my particular view of the world. The first one is introject. Remember I talked about that baby trying to make sense of and organizing things? Well, the other part that they do is they just absorb all of this stuff from their environment, and particularly from mom and dad. And so if you put something into a baby's mouth, he'll swallow it because he does not yet have the skill base or understanding to know what's good for him and what is and what is not. He trusts mom and dad implicitly, so if they've given it to him or he can put it in his mouth, this must be good for me. He doesn't yet know how to discriminate what's good for him and what isn't. So what we call that in terms of values, beliefs, ideals that also children absorb and take from their parents are introjects. They've swallowed in all of this stuff from their parents. They've taken it in deeply. And a big job of psychotherapy is to figure out what those beliefs are and to bring them up to the surface of consciousness. And then you can chew on them and discard that which doesn't work for you and keep that which does. It isn't just taking it in whole hook, line, and sinker as being absolutely true. The other concept from Gestalt therapy I'd like to describe for you is the paradoxical theory of change. In short, you have to own something before you can change it. The classic example is being an alcoholic. Until you can admit that you're an alcoholic, you can't begin to deal with your alcoholism. And that's true for any negative belief about you, particularly shame, which shame, of course, is the major component of sexual abuse survivors and how they see themselves. And so consequently, you have to say, I'm bad, and you have to really own that. You have to, I'm broken, I'm vile, I'm soiled, I'm perverted. Whatever the negative belief is, is you have to own that, and then you can begin to change it. So let me suggest a self-exercise here. 
I'd like you to go back to childhood, wherever you want, as early as you're comfortable, and recall a painful story. And then tell that story or think it through. And then see if you can understand or come to understand, and you may need to do this exercise with somebody else to give you some outside perspective, but what's the conclusion you came to about how the world is organized and how you fit into it from that experience? I can give an example. There was a young man whose jaw was dislodged by his sister. He was in the fifth grade. He went to school and they had x-rayed and saw that the, the jaw was a little out of place. And they had told him that when he needed, he was in pain, to go to the nurse's office and get ice for that jaw and to alleviate the pain. So at some point in the day he did that. He went to the nurse's office to get ice to make his jaw feel better. He was greeted by the principal and the nurse. And his older brother, as it turned out, was the local juvenile delinquent. And so I guess this was the first time that he was really on the radar of the principal. And so the principal and the nurse held him hostage for several hours and terrorized him how he must be lying. This couldn't possibly tr be true. And he was just like his older brother. The conclusion he reached from that experience was that he would never put himself in the position of being controlled by anybody ever again. He would never give them that kind of power. And it set him up for a lifetime of conflict with authority and having a really difficult time trusting people. These small experiences as a child can have big rippling impacts throughout the rest of a person's life. And psychotherapy is at its best going after those conclusions and reworking them so that we can actually be present in the world instead of trapped in that faraway time when that little child was wounded and hurt by a situation or people that he had no power or control of. If you're a therapist, the next step of this with a client is to, once they identify that negative belief about what happened to them when they were sexually abused, or the negative belief about themselves, that I'm soiled, I'm dirty, I'm perverted, I'm whatever, is to have them look you in the eye and say it to you. Most states have a mandated reporter law. That means that when you, under certain circumstances, when you find out that a, a man or a child is sexually abused, you're required to report. And so most therapists default to say, I have to do this because the government is making me do that. I think that's the wrong position to take. One, it's giving up your power, which I think is never a particularly good idea. But second of all, there's actually a clinical case to be made for reporting. That step of calling up and making the report that I was sexually abused by this person, he violated me, I'm a victim, is a first important step in healing. And so if you're in a situation where you must make a report, where you're required, for the, if at all possible, hold on to your power, make a case for why this is important and how you'll be there through them through every step and that they'll be fine so that it can begin the healing process and not make this a situation where they're being victimized by now a government entity that's making them do something that they don't want to do. And so this is really important in how you hold this, how you handle this, and how you set this up for the client. Forgiveness is a topic you hear about a lot for abuse survivors. And I'm personally not a big fan of forgiveness. I think it's way overused. I think that it's used as bypass to a vent, or it's used as a means to stop the pain. And that you'll see this woman on TV whose child was just killed by somebody, and she's immediately giving her forgiveness to this person. And that's just absolute nonsense. You have to go through the grief. You have to deal with the pain. You have to go with the anger and the denial and the depression and all the other stages of grieving before you can get to that point of acceptance. Forgiveness is a religious concept. And while I'm not anti-religious, I am anti-rushing to the end part and trying to avoid all those other parts in between. And so the key really is acceptance, not forgiveness. And I like to use Oprah's quote on forgiveness. And she says, Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could have been any different. 
Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could have been any different. That is acceptance. And that is the goal, not forgiveness. If somebody gets to a point of forgiveness, fine. I'm not anti that, but they have to go through the other pieces first. Do not let them hide in forgiveness and avoid the healing that has to come. So let me talk a little bit about the process of when somebody discloses in therapy what you should do. The first step is to believe them. This may seem really obvious, but it, in so many cases, it's questions, it's doubted, the question is believe them. It's so important that they get that validation, that they're taking this enormous risk of putting this out there and to then not be disbelieved or questioned or interrogated as whether well, this is really true can be really wounding and can re-victimize them. Do not extrapolate. They have partial memories. This is sort of coming back. There's pieces showing up. Do not fill in the blanks. That's about your anxiety, not theirs. That's about your needing to have an answer, not theirs. Their job is to stay in the unknown and the blanks may never be filled in and that's okay. Our job is not to get to the truth. Our job is to heal the pain, to clear it out of the body and to clear it out of the person so that they aren't bothered by this anymore. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. If they hold it that it's true, it's inside of them and that's what has to be healed. And I speak of this from the age memory issue. The younger a child, the less reliable the memory. Consequently, a child doesn't get concrete or continuous memory until they're between six and 12 years old. And so a young child can associate two different things in their brain that don't have any connection to each other. Like they were watching this TV program and then this happened and somehow they get conflated together into the same thing. And so that is an enormous wound for that child or potentially. And so your job is to heal the wound, not to validate its truth or to tear it apart. That's a much later piece if that's ever even addressed at all. The child is holding in a particular way. Your job is to heal it. And sometimes it's just somatic memories. They can feel the overwhelming experience. It may have been pre-verbal. They may be taken back to this really regressed place. Your job is to clear it out of their body. I had a client who's been with me a long, long, long time, and he started having memories of being sexually abused in the bathroom by his uncle. There were holes in the memory. We simply stayed with it over a long period of time. This is months probably a couple of years as he was filling in the blanks himself as more memories emerged. And it never was a complete total memory because he was only like five years old at the time. But our job was to clear it out of his body and to particularly the somatic piece of that. Because if you're clearing it out of the body, you're clearing it out of the person. It isn't just a matter of understanding. As I often say, understanding is the booby prize. It doesn't matter if you understand. It matters that you clear it. So your job is to stay with that feeling and by whatever methodology you use to have them move through the experience with your support, with your holding them in that room, in that space, so that they're safe to have the feelings that they could not have as a child. That is our job and that is where the healing takes place. Shame is the core issue. A child, when sexually abused, because they're so young, will make it their fault. It's their fault that mommy and daddy are fighting before the divorce. It's their fault that mommy and daddy divorced. It's their fault that daddy slammed the car door. Children are normally and healthily narcissistic. It's all about them. So if they're sexually abused, it's their fault. There's something they did that's wrong. They were seductive. They're spoiled. They're wrong. It's about them. It's not about what the other person did to them. And so that core shame that they've taken in is what must be addressed and is at the central part of the recovery of sexual abuse. The other big issue to address, of course, is safety in making sure that the client is safe as a family member or somebody outside the family who could 
and potentially have retribution on them for reporting this and so forth, your job is to pay attention to that particular issue and help them be aware of that. Not to make them paranoid, but just to have an honest assessment of really what the risks are for this individual and how to best handle that. If a family member or a trusted person uh, was the person who violated them, then that creates a whole separate set of issues around boundaries and trust. And the relationship with the therapist will be so important because the trust issues will come to the surface and it's really important that you pay particular attention to that as that wound is healed, that they have to have somebody they can ultimately trust. Be sure and pay attention if they're still in touch with the perpetrator so that you know how to handle that. Again, that's a safety issue. So the first goal is owning the experience, owning if they were a victim, owning that it happened to them, and dealing with that paradoxical theory of change so that they can begin healing. Feeling the pain. They have to go through the pain. EMDR, again, is one of the fastest ways to move through that pain, but it's essential that it happen. Something we also don't talk about very often is feeling the pleasure. For so many people, or so many guys, there's a pleasurable experience in the abuse. And so consequently, they have to own that and they have to separate it from the pain and the humiliation. It's like it gets braided all together and you have to very carefully unwind that braid so that they deal with the humiliation, they deal with the pain, they deal with all those pieces, but then they have to own and embody the pleasure. That's part of really taking back the power of the experience and not giving it away to this person. They have to move through the anger. It's really important that there's space for them to be angry. The pounding, the pillows, the screaming, the crying, the rage that can come up. They have to grieve the loss of innocence, the loss of a childhood, the loss of time. And that's our compassion is so important in that. And just accepting that that's been part of making them who they are. So ultimately, again, it's about acceptance. I am who I am today because this happened to me, and I like me today. If you can say that, that moves a long way toward healing and moving past being stuck in the past and the pain of those experiences and fully being present. And ultimately, they have to feel good, that they are good at who they are and they see some benefit from perspective, that they have more compassion for people for victims, that they're a better person in some way, maybe because this happened to them. A quote that is the foundation of my work as a therapist comes from a wonderful book called If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him by Sheldon Kopp. It's actually a very famous quote from the Buddha about a a monk who encountered him on the road one day and said he was searching for the Buddha to get enlightened. And the Buddha says to him, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. The wisdom is inside of you. Do not give away your power. And so the quote is, real change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Real change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Often our job is to increase the pain so that they are able and willing to make a different choice. We do that with alcoholics. We point out the pain points and we make the pain larger so that they can see the consequences of their drinking. So when you're dealing with men who are sexually abused, you may have to increase their pain by pointing out how this has had such a negative impact on their life and increasing their pain so that they're willing to face it and make a different choice and move toward healing. This is a man's journey and I encourage you to support him in any way you possibly can to make that happen. Thanks for spending this time with me and have a great life. Mm -hmm.